Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Humboldt County in California, about two miles downriver from Bluff Creek Resort, we have a small mobile home. It was about 2 a.m. I was playing solitaire at the kitchen table when I heard a series of low, resonant yells turning into high-pitched screams. Immediately, I recognized the calls as it had been described to me so many times by my dad and my mom and aunt and uncle. I'm 54 years old, and I finally heard it. I'm thrilled. I'll never forget it. My husband was sleeping and did not hear it. On to the next one. My eight-year-old son and I were hiking the Grasshopper Trail in the Humboldt Redwood State Park, Burlington Campground, between We Ought to the North and Myers Flat to the South, in Humboldt County in California. The time was approximately between 3 and 4 p.m. on an August day. We were about a quarter of a mile up the trail from the river. We were walking relatively quiet and slow along the path when we stopped on the path for a moment for my son to tie his shoe. As I waited, I surveyed the thick redwood area above. As I looked, I noticed something moving about 150 to 200 feet in the distance next to an old, large redwood stump. The more I looked, I began to see more mass of the creature. I finally realized what it probably was and what it was doing. It had a human-like torso from the waist up, and it appeared as if it was scratching its back against the stump. I gained a back and profile view before I could no longer overcome the intense fear I was experiencing. I urged my son, as serious as I could, to run as fast as he could. After running, for about 30 seconds to a minute, we stopped. I wanted badly to go back and investigate, but understood I could not do this with my son. I know the exact location of where the stump is, and I plan to go back within a week. I hope to find something at the stump. On to the next one. In Tulamine County, this occurred in the Emigrants Wilderness, just outside of Kennedy Meadow. During the last week of August, myself and a friend left the Kennedy Trailhead about an hour before dark. After about one and a half to two hours of hiking, we decided to camp. We had just crossed the first major bridge over the Kennedy Soda Can Creek, and we doubled back a ways to find a spot to camp for the night. We were about 15 yards from the creek itself. At around midnight to 1 a.m., I was drifting off to sleep when I heard a large, heavy, two-legged creature walking across the creek. Since the creek was deep, I could clearly hear it splashing. It would walk a little while, stop, then continue. This went on for about a minute. Although we did see another camper about 200 to 300 feet away, I can't imagine why someone would be walking across the creek at that time of night. I didn't notice any smell, other sounds, or footprints. I was trying to sleep. My friend did not hear anything. It was between midnight and 1 a.m. There was a full or near full moon that night, which allowed us to hike at night. The area was pine forest at about 8,000 feet in elevation. Previously, sometime between 1961 and 1963, while I was staying at a rented cabin at Strawberry, I'd walked down to the creek near the road that goes out of the backside of Pinecrest Lake, very near the old bridge. I was about 200 to 300 feet from the cabin and only 15 feet from a small pine tree. 
when all of a sudden it began shaking violently. It shook for several seconds, stopped, then did it again. I ran back to the cabin and never saw what caused the shaking. On to the next one. Above Huntington Lake in Fresno County. My 15-year-old cousin and I were walking in a meadow below the ranch cookhouse. It was late October, and the other ranch hands had left for the season, leaving my cousin and I to close up the ranch for the winter. There were no other people around the area. The summer backpackers had all gone. It was around dusk when we heard a noise. It started out as a low rumble. We almost felt it before we heard it. But then it rose in volume and pitch. It was like a babbling scream. It could almost sound like words. The scream lasted at least 30 seconds or more, then rose to a shriek and ended abruptly. It sounded as though it came from a point 50 or so yards from where we were standing, a thick grove of trees and deadfalls we call the island. I could hear something moving in the trees, and starting to circle the meadow we were in. It screamed again, and sounded as though it had moved to our right. My cousin and I were shaken by the noise, and we ran for the cookhouse. Sitting inside, we heard it again, and it sounded as though it was now in the meadow below us. But the darkness made it impossible to see anything. At this time, we moved from the cook's cabin to a building we call the winter room. We locked the door and spent the night there. The room is bear-proof and therefore safe. We heard it maybe five more times around the ranch, and once I was woken up at maybe three in the morning by something outside the room. The next day, I searched for tracks, but the ground was frozen, though it hadn't snowed yet. We found no tracks, but there was a handprint on the door of a storeroom where we kept food from bears during the summer. The print of the palm was nearly as big as both my palms put together, and the fingers were as big as three of mine in length. This hand had long fingers. The print was upside down near the bottom of the door, as though it was trying to pry the door open from the bottom. The print was still partly there the next summer. At the time, it seemed oily. I have been backpacking and camping since I was five years old. I've grown up in the mountains and live on the ranch. I've heard mountain lions on more than one occasion. I've also heard a wounded bear scream. Someone had shot it. The noise that my cousin and I heard was unlike anything I've heard ever. We called it the Yargle thing and joked about it after the fact. But at the time, it really scared us. I don't scare easily. We mountain men are from tough stock. I have heard and seen nothing since. On to the next one. In Imperial County in California, I was driving back from Blythe heading south back home to Holtville, and it was about 10 p.m. I slowed my semi down, going through the mountains, when I came to a pullout and got out to relieve myself. While I was standing on the passenger side of my truck, that's when I heard a sound of rocks falling. When I looked up, I saw something that I can't describe in words. It ran 20 yards in front of my truck, heading east. I jumped back in my truck and drove off. I never told anybody about this, not even my wife, because I thought people would think I was crazy. I have never drove that highway again at night. What I saw was about seven or eight feet tall. It was grayish brown, and what scared me the most was the grunt it made when it crossed the highway. I've heard hunters talk about having rocks thrown at them off the tops of the mountain at night while they're sitting at their campfires and cries being heard at night. It was 10 p.m. The sky was clear, and you could see the silhouettes of the mountain, which were very clear. It was Rocky Mountains on the north side of the highway, which was mainly desert. Also, there was vegetation about 20 miles north of where I had stopped, on the highway toward Blythe. On to the next one. 
in Del Notre County in California. We are a middle-aged couple from Longview, Washington. We were on a trip to Reno and Tahoe, went over to California and back up the coast, going home to Longview, Washington. Ahead on the road, about dark, was what I thought was a statue on the right, suddenly ran, or more correctly, bounded across the road in front of our car, perhaps 20 feet. In fact, I thought I might hit it. It was too fast for a human, and approximately seven to eight feet tall, 300 to 500 pounds, and large, and looked like the pictures, except I could not see the face. It had dark black fur. In bounding, I mean it used all leg and not two to go across the road in front of us. We, my wife and I, are not skeptical anymore. The animal was standing upright on the side of the road. When he ran, he was on two legs, but he used his arms to leap about the middle of the road. The nearest town is Crescent City, coming out of the Pacific Coast Highway, north real near the ocean. We stopped at the Azteca restaurant and told the owner about the encounter. On to the next one. It was in 2007 when my hunting partner and I went into the Wealth Gray Provincial Park on a moose hunt. We took my ram north from Clearwater Station onto a secondary road, which eventually turned into an unpaved road. It was a rough and bumpy go for almost 10 miles. Eventually, we reached the southern tip of Clearwater Lake, where we could make camp and begin our hunt. The plan was to work the timber going northward around Clearwater, Azure, and Hobson's Lake until we found what we came for, which was a big bull moose. Our base camp was to be the truck. We were backpacking a small mountain tent and light supplies, the reason being that if we bagged a moose, it would have to be butchered and carried back out. This scenario is rough enough if you're close to your camp, but should we get our mark up by Hobson Lake, it would require several trips with a lot of heavy meat on our backs. There is some extremely challenging terrain in here, even for a seasoned hiker. But when you add 175 pounds of meat to the pack, it can get really interesting in a hurry. On our first day out, we had patrolled the eastern edges of Lake Clearwater with little result to show for our efforts. We had called in one bull that was relatively immature and had seen a couple of cows as well. That afternoon, we hiked back to the truck and spent the night under the stars, pondering our plans for the following day's hunt. At sunup, we were heading due northeast for the eastern end of Azure Lake, which was a spot we had tagged a huge bull several years ago. Now, Azure had proved to be more promising than what we had seen near Clearwater, but still. We were not committed to the fact that there was nothing better to be found elsewhere. Once again, we withdrew from the timber, leaving ourselves enough time for the five or six mile trek back. The next day, we were committing ourselves to some serious mileage in hopes of attaining our goal. To reach the lower end of Hobson would be six miles one way and over 12 to the northern end keeping in mind that anything shot up there would have to be butchered and carried out the same way we had come in. We crossed through the shallows in an area where three lakes meet and started to work the lower, narrow portion of Hobson Lake heading north. The day turned bleak, and it had started to rain, first very lightly and then more heavily. We were nearing midday when our call sounded like it was attracting something more along the line of what we came for. As we watched and called, a huge old bull came plowing through the brush about a hundred yards out from our position, and he was committed. We waited and continued to call. When he was about 40 yards out, my partner Brendan pulled the trigger. The bull dropped where he stood. We huddled around the beast and began the task of butchering the meat. By the time we had finished, we would have barely enough time to make it back to the truck, let alone making two trips with the spoils. Now in these woods, there are a fair amount of grizzlies, so our plan was to bag what we could carry and hoist it into the trees, 
coming back for it the next day. This is an extremely dangerous scenario to enter into, and I don't recommend it to anyone. The butchering site alone would be enough to attract a bear from miles away, and we wouldn't be coming back in until the following day. This is the day we refer to as entering the danger zone, and for good reason. Many a hunter has been mauled or killed coming across a bear in such a situation as this. We lifted the remaining meat off the ground some 15 feet, hanging it from a stout bough, and commenced with our hike back to camp. Between the two of us, we were carrying well over 300 pounds of meat and had a solid seven miles ahead of us. If you think that this is easy, well, think again. By the time we made it back to camp, my body was burning from head to toe. We collapsed by the fire for a well-needed bite to eat and some rest knowing that we had to return early tomorrow for the remaining spoils. Throughout the night and continuing into the morning, it was raining hard, and despite the weather, we had begun our hike back into the danger zone. By this time, there could easily be one or more bears in the area, having sniffed out our previous day's activity. The forest was extremely tight and dense where we had hoisted the meat, so, as we neared the area, our hiking speed had come to a crawl. There is no moving quickly as you close in on the zone. Every step and every move is meticulously plotted out and taken, looking in every direction at every turn for a bear that may be awaiting us. The rain was unrelenting as we approached the site. It was nerve-wracking in that the noise from the rain alone would drown out any sounds that an approaching carnivore might be making and we were on edge. As we came into the site, both of the sacks were gone from the tree. One of the ropes was still tied to the tree's trunk, and the remainder was lying on the ground. The other rope was still hanging over the bough, but the rope's end was snapped off, with the sack being taken. As we were taking all of this in, we were still very much on guard for anything else that may be approaching or in the vicinity. At this point, the rain was coming down in buckets, and the ground was saturated around the site. I was standing looking at the rope hanging from the bow when my eyes were suddenly drawn downward. Below me and all around me in the wet peat were enormous footprints throughout the entire area. I put my boot alongside one of them, and they were double that of my own, which made them about 20 inches long. The two of us stood there, completely aghast at the spectacle of what we were seeing. We both knew that these were the prints of a Sasquatch, a Sasquatch that had just taken our remaining moose meat. I don't think that either of us in that moment could fully accept what it was that we were looking at. We had heard stories and seen the film clips and the like, but now this beast had become a part of her own reality. We were looking down on the footprints of something that is said to not exist, and now we had proof. You will have to trust me, and yet, having said that, it's more than likely that you won't when I say that there was positively nothing around in these parts that could have left such tracks other than a Sasquatch. As we gathered our composure, we could now see where the beast had entered the site and where it had exited. There were hundreds of deeply compressed prints in the peat, coming and going from the same point in the woods indicating exactly where it had traveled. Having nothing left to do but hike back, we left the site and returned back to the truck. One of the most amazing aspects of this was the thought of a single creature snapping a half-inch thick piece of climbing rope from a bag dangling at 12 feet off the ground, and then making its way off single-handedly carrying some 350 pounds of meat, and perhaps more. Whether or not people choose to believe in their existence is of no consequence to me from this point forward. We now know for ourselves that beyond the shadow of a doubt, they do exist and are roaming in the forests of British Columbia at the very least. Just to reach that height and to have that strength to snap climbing rope should put the fear in anyone, in my opinion. On to the next one. In the summer heat of 1973, 
a mysterious creature was lurking about in Edwardsville, Illinois, and the sightings of this monster would prove to be bizarre and unusual. Like all good mysteries, this one originated at night. Late one June evening at 1.30 a.m., a local Frederick Street resident called police to warn them of a strange creature roaming about the neighborhood. The witness claimed that he had spotted a strange creature the likes of which he had never seen before. The broad-shouldered reddish beast stood over six and a half feet tall and had a rank, musty smell accompanying it. Apparently, the mysterious creature had previously been seen stealthily moving out of Springer's woods. According to the Edwardsville Intelligencer, a friend of the first witness also claimed that the monster had snuck up behind him and grabbed him, tearing his shirt and scratching his chest. He was able to get a good look at the beast's red eyes and offered a safety tip that the beast did not like light and would scream when light was shined in its eyes. As is so often the case with unknown monster sighting, it appears that whatever this beast was, it was fleeting, evidenced by the fact that no other follow-up articles on the beast have surfaced. If the monster was seen again, it was not reported. On to the next one. As a high schooler in the state of Maryland, my friends and I, as well as many other classmates, would frequent an area that had somewhat of a reputation for being a hangout, both before and after the sun went down. It was in late May of that year, with all the students just itching to get outside any time they could. Having endured a rough winter that a buzz started going around the school about some of the kids saying they had seen a monster or something of the sort while at this hangout spot of which I speak. Having said as much, there were a lot of bad drugs around at that point in time, and I knew there were a fair number of students who were sampling them, with some of them having been killed for their efforts, which was a crying shame. Nevertheless, when I heard this rumor, my first question was that of who started it. My thoughts were that someone was suffering from some type of drug-induced hallucination, which rendered them seeing a monster in the woods. Suffice to say, myself and some of the other non-druggies were still frequenting this spot, but amazingly, the amount of young people who were still coming there had greatly diminished after the rumor had made its way around the campus. It was a Friday night when seven of us had piled into my friend Jay's van and headed over to the area. Jay's parents were quite wealthy and had bought him a brand new conversion van complete with chairs, bed, table, and stereo, and all of us were packed in it, sitting at the end of this dead-end street for the evening. Having arrived just before sunset, we were all outside in the open lot. We were having a catch with several frisbees until the sun had set, listening to the music and having a good time. Now, I didn't drink or do anything at the time, and all of us were underage. But my friend, Wendy, had gone into town, and without being proofed by the owner of the liquor store, she had procured a bottle of this pre-mixed screwdriver stuff. Basically, it was vodka and orange juice, and she drank the entire pint warm. It was about an hour after sunset that Wendy went outside into the edge of the trees and began to puke her brains out. Suddenly, she let out a scream and came running across the front of the van, leaping into the side door, saying there was some type of creature in the woods and with all of us trying to come to grips with what she was jabbering about, Jay, who was sitting in the driver's seat, suddenly shouts out, Oh, crap! and threw his headlights on, illuminating this monstrosity of a beast in the edge of the trees. As soon as the lights hit it, the creature raised its arm to shield its eyes from the lights, and all the girls screamed. Literally a second later, the monster dropped its arm, 
made a loud, snarling sound and took two steps toward the front hood of the van. Jay basically started the van and dropped it into reverse as fast as it could possibly be done, and everyone in the van went flying and tumbling around as he floored the van, first in reverse and then in drive. This thing that we all had seen appeared to be half man and half mountain goat. It was covered sparsely in what I would say was hair and had a large pair of horns which curved from its upper forehead to the back of its head. It had very long ears that came to a point at the top, and its face was long and narrow, also ending in somewhat of a pointed-looking chin. Its nose and its eyebrows looked like they were connected in the form of a protruding type of ridge, with its nose having many distinct wrinkles in it when it snarled, kind of like a timber wolf when it growled. It was very frightening, to say the least. The body was extremely muscular, coming from the chest down to a very lean and tapered waistline, and its legs were long and skinny, but equally muscular in appearance. The eyes in the headlights were glowing fluorescent green, and its snout seemed to be angled downward, beginning just below its eye, in such a way that when it snarled, we really couldn't see its teeth. None of us ever went back there again, and to this day I'm left wondering what exactly it was we saw that night in Maryland. On to the next one. A relative of mine had been a sort of partner in the Wolf Creek Inn near Grants Pass, Oregon, which is on current Interstate Highway 5. Back in the waning years of stagecoach travel and the building of the railroad, there was a period where both services were using the same stopovers, and there was a tent city on the grounds surrounding the Wolf Creek Inn to house the railroad crews. Workers would pick up lunches from the kitchen, and evening meals were served inside the main hall and in the large mess tent. These railroad laborers worked hard, and there was very little partying, drinking, gambling, or even fighting at night after the long work shifts. The rooms in the inn were occupied by regular stagecoach passengers and the occasional railroad executive, but the top brass usually had Pullman coaches on sidings next to the track laying, so as to not only save expenses, but to allow the inns along the way to earn an uninterrupted living from regular travelers who depended on their accommodation, as in those days, you couldn't just drive down the line to the next hotel. Well, according to Aunt Emily's notations in her diary, there were several incidents that she had to respond to, such as visitations by a large ape-like creature that at first was described as a bear that walked on its hind legs. Emily's notes in her diary on several pages showed the majority of the people back then had absolutely no knowledge of apes, gorillas, and other creatures as America's vast western areas were still in pioneer mode and, for the most part, only familiar with animals common to their own environment. Occasionally, schools would show drawings of exotic animals from other areas, but seldom would parents have exposure to their offspring's primers, and if so, the father seldom had the luxury of even glancing at the drawing, as simply surviving was an effort in those tough times. Aunt Emily made notes on maybe one out of every four or five pages about these large, hairy, and man-like giant bears that walked on their hind legs and used their oversized hairy paws like humans do. Several of the track layers who were in the capacity of today's foremen carried revolvers and my aunt cited several incidents where there had been shots fired at these giants, but she didn't indicate if any were killed or wounded. However, the many notations she had related, they were important enough events to cause everyone concern at the time. There would be stretches of time where Aunt Emily didn't make any notations, so it wasn't like a dear diary book. It was more a record of events that were worth noting. 
only one encounter seemed important enough to have many notations on various search parties or posses, as my aunt called them, such at the time where about 30 men went armed to the small rough mountain that has since been renamed London Peak in pursuit of two of these animals that had totally destroyed one of only two merchantile and food supply stores in the area. Although Aunt M noted that a lot of food had apparently been eaten, there were open sacks of flour and sugar that showed tracks of multiple animals that she noted looked like four or five adults, but maybe two smaller ones as well. M noted, after a mob pursued the group toward what is now London Peak, many shots were reportedly fired and the men claimed to have killed at least two of them. But they said the animals were way up on the steep cliffs and after they fell, no bodies were ever found. Believe me, though, those steep, jagged cliffs could hide clouds. I've not been to that area for many years, but I've an uncle who lives in Roseburg, Oregon, which is only a few miles away, and he said his father was in the posse, so he verified that part of it as factual. He also said that many of his relatives still living in Wolf Creek have often spoke of what they called the Wolfmen of Wolf Creek. No, that wasn't what the name came from, just a later nickname, according to other old-timers I've spoken with. On to the next one. Near Post Falls in Kootenai County in Idaho, my wife and myself were trucking. We stopped on I-90 just west of Post Falls, Idaho. I was very tired. I did my paperwork and I needed to step out. I walked around my truck and relieved myself. I did not hear anything, but I got a feeling and looked to my left. I saw it face to face. He was no more than 10 feet from me. I cannot tell you how I felt. He was a giant. My wife and I could have both died if he would have been angry. I think he was there to see us. I went back slowly into my truck and left. Before I left, we heard him run back into the forest. He broke limbs like they were nothing. His strength was unreal. He broke branches two to three inches in diameter like they were nothing. My wife saw it through the window when I got back into the truck. It was about 1 a.m. on a Saturday at the beginning of December. It was very dark with only the truck ID lights on. The area is a mountainous area with very heavy forest and thick underbrush. On to the next one. I was working as a deputy sheriff in Adams County in Idaho. I was traveling north on the US-95 about 10 miles north of Council, well after dark. I was headed to an accident scene at high speed with a light and siren going off. A large, hairy creature came up the embankment in front of my car, crossed the road, and went up the embankment on the opposite side of the road. I have no idea how fast I was traveling, but if this had been a normal forest animal, I would have hit it before it comprehended its crossing of the road. I couldn't really tell what it was, except that it walked on two legs and had dark fur. Several times, I had removed small boulders from the road in that area to keep cars from running into them. Usually, this happened after a rainstorm, so it was probably not the creature. I had smelled odors, something like that of a strong, rotten meat in this area. I had several people say that their livestock were acting strange. A fellow officer had cast a large human-like footprint he had found while hunting. The area was a pine forest. On to the next one. Eight Balding Area residents in the Nez Perce County in Idaho say they saw a large hairy creature Thursday evening that could have been a Bigfoot. The unidentified creature was spotting descended a hillside southwest of Nez Perce National Historical Park Visitor Center at Spalding. I looked up and it was just too big and dark to be a man, Becky Johnson said Friday. It was six or seven o'clock. There was still a lot of daylight left, 
Jonathan tried to photograph the creature as it walked across a plowed field almost a half a mile away. But she said her camera was not equipped with a telephoto lens, and the small negative recorded just a tiny black speck. Frank Walker, the park superintendent, said a park employee also reported seeing a large, dark creature walking down the hillside Thursday evening. Tony Arthur saw the creature much closer up. He and two other family members spotted the suspected Sasquatch on the hillside from the home of Moffett and Rachel Johnson. Arthur said he and two others drove down a nearby gravel road to get closer. They spotted the creature crouching behind some bushes at the edge of the field about a quarter of a mile from U.S. Highway 95. I'd say we were about 100 to 120 yards away. It was mostly behind the bush and it kind of crouched down. He said others were watching the creature too, including one man who had binoculars, and said that he was a man, but he wouldn't let us look through the binoculars. Arthur said he was convinced that what he saw was not a man. I'd say it had to have been at least seven feet tall, he said. The animal was covered with long, shaggy, dark hair. He and others who saw the creature said it did not appear to be a bear because it walked upright for such a long distance. On to the next one. I wanted to live like Grizzly Adams, and I moved to a remote wilderness in northern Idaho. To give an idea of how remote an area this was, the Forest Service Road just past our place was gated off to protect grizzly bears. Only a handful of people lived in this area, spread out over a dozen 24-acre properties. Everything else was just extreme wilderness. The night of my encounter meeting Bigfoot was the last thing on my mind, and I must say I was confused by what I saw as well as being left utterly speechless. Although I had grown up in Northern California and was familiar with Bigfoot lore, I had pretty much filed it away as a neat story, but not something to believe in. When you are broke and living on a mountain, there is not much to do except get together with neighbors and have a good time. Our lot was no different. I must admit that during this time of my life, drinking was not big on my list, and this evening was no different. However, it was Halloween, and I had had some beer earlier in the evening between 5 to 8 p.m. or so. Please remember, though, that I was weighing in at 240 pounds, and the actual sighting was well into the night, probably around 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. the following morning. So, anyway, my ex and I were at the Halloween party and had slipped into our normal silent argument routine. So, needless to say, we were not talking. One of the neighbors had arrived with a tractor pulling a trailer loaded with straw in hopes of taking everyone on a hayride. Eventually, we left on the hayride. There were around 16 of us, evenly made up of adults and children of all ages, costumes and all. Upon leaving, I don't think we had a destination in mind, but someone eventually suggested we head to Bloom Lake a small mountain lake with rough access that would require leaving the tractor at the logging site and walking the remaining half a mile or so. As stated earlier, my ex and I were giving each other the silent treatment and found ourselves drifting to the back of the two-by-two -two line. Eventually, we had allowed enough space to develop between us and the pack to lose sight of them as they went around bends in the trail. As we neared the lake, the trail forked in two directions, both led to the lake. My ex and I were just close enough to see the backside of the last person headed down the trail to the right. As we came to the fork, I was closest to the center fork while my ex was on the outside on the far right. Right as we approached the intersection, I focused on a being crouched down at the base of a tree where the trails came together. This animal stayed put while I tried to figure out what I was seeing. It felt like total slow motion. I had a visual of the animal. I was staring right at it. However, the animal did not seem to be interested in eye contact. Just as we passed by and the animal was to my left behind me, I looked over my shoulder to see it rise silently next to the tree it had been crouching next to. Being six foot three, I would guess this being to be about eight feet tall. 
Standing now, this animal still did not want eye contact and kept us in its peripheral vision. I looked forward, and I could still see the back of the last person ahead of us. I wanted to yell out to everyone, but figured it not the best thing to do. I doubt that I was close enough to touch it, but am quite sure he could have reached me without taking a step. I thought that I should say something to my ex, but I was speechless. I looked over my shoulder again to see this animal take a huge, silent step out of the brush and then take two or three more up the trail we had come down before being out of sight. These steps were large, silent, and punctuated with this long arm swinging with a stride. I spent many years wondering how no one else saw this and never told anyone from that night, except the ex, about it. I was familiar with forests, wildlife, and had viewed several species at length before this. I've always consoled myself by saying I'm not sure what I saw, but I do know what I didn't see, and it wasn't a bear, elk, mountain lion, moose, or anything else I can think of. Even after this encounter, I still thought most of the TV shows were jokes, but I realized I did see Bigfoot. I always wondered what Bigfoot thought about 16 people coming down the trail at this time of night, costumes and all. This area is remote. 16 people at any time would have been a shock. He must have been surprised. I've lived in this area for around six years. In that time, I viewed large footprints in the snow, mud, and softer shoulder soil. I visited another nearby lake by foot access one time, and upon reaching the top of the trail, found a large scat pile and could smell the rankest odor. I felt like I was not alone and headed home immediately. From time to time, I would hear shrieks in the forest around my cabin. I would usually feel very angry dealing with my ex, and these things would just get filed away as something to worry about later. It was around midnight with a full moon and good light. It was a small mountain lake evergreen forest with minimal hardwood with a small primitive campsite all around the lake. On to the next one. I saw an upright animal standing on the road on the north side of the Salmon River. It was after dark and I caught him in my headlights. He stood for about 10 seconds in my headlights and then jumped off the bank down into the river bottom. The animal was about 7 feet tall, remained upright, was brown in color, and his eyes showed green in the headlights. When he jumped off the road, the creature was very agile and jumped easily. I was driving out of the North Fork after dropping friends off who were going to float the river to Riggings, Idaho. The time of day was approximately midnight. He was on the road about two miles west of Panther Creek and where the road is on the north side of the river. It is very steep country, and he was caught while crossing the road. He stood on the road for about 10 seconds and then jumped down into the river bottom, which is quite narrow along this road. The country is forested and very steep. On to the next one. This incident occurred at about 6 p.m., the nearest road is Three Bear Road. When we arrived to our camp from an early spotlighting mission for game, we were breaking down for dinner. There was a sound which sounded like a mule and wailing screams. This occurred only once, but lasted for about 15 seconds. It is hard to describe these sounds in print, but whoever I tell my story to, I always get goosebumps. We had a 1.5 million candle powered spotlight and could not see too far into the brush because it was so dense. But we saw something about seven to eight feet in height, with a hairy body, but with an open face with not so much hair on the face. It had bigger eyes than normal, even though we could only see it in the reflection of the eyes. They reflected back at us as blue-green to a slight red tint. The creature only remained in the light for only a few seconds, and covered his eyes when the light was directly shined into it. His hands were so big, and the palm was hairless. The creature was supporting itself or bracing between two trees about six inches in diameter. His hands clearly wrapped around the trees. We both couldn't believe our eyes, and grabbed our rifles after it shambled off into the woods. The whole night, we could hear something walking around our campsite with ease. I was kind of scared, but 
had sufficient firepower to kill anything in these woods. We did build a bigger fire, and it took us many hours to go to bed that night. The next day, I went up to look for anything unusual and noticed freshly twisted limbs on white fir trees about five to eight and a half feet tall. The pitch was just barely coming out, so it was only a few hours old. These twistlings were about 50 to about 200 yards from our camp, sight all around us. It was too dry for any quality track. I've been in the woods for a good part of my life, and I never thought this could happen to me or ever happen again. I'm still scared of that area to this day, but I want to return to search for more evidence of Bigfoot. I believe now. We just moved to that location in the afternoon and both split up and went scouting for game and noticed that everything looked dead. There was plenty of game sign, but nothing was around. The whole area was spooky, dead quiet. With the amount of game sign, we decided to hunt the next day there. After what we both experienced, we know why this area was sterile and spooky. The next day, we hunted together and never got off each other's heels. The time was late evening, around 6 p.m., and being about a quarter of a mile from a lake, the fog was setting in. The weather conditions were overcast during the day and clearing off by nighttime with lake fog coming in. There was no moon and it was pitch black. I don't understand how anything could see. This part of Idaho is known as flood wood. Western white pine and cedar and red fir are the most prevalent kind of trees. There are a ton of brush and ferns with some grass on the old logging road. The untouched areas look like something out of a book of prehistoric vegetation. It's awesome looking. We got into an area where we were not supposed to be going around locked BLM gates. We were far from any other hunters by at least 10 miles. To the west of us is Elk Creek, and below us is Dorswack Lake, a 56-mile-long lake. Also, there were many small creeks and bogs and springs. Not only with my report, but... There were two more reports in the same general area by worthy people. One incident, these two brothers, out scouting for elk before hunting season, were coming down this road where this big, hairy, bipedal creature ran in front of them down off the bank across the creek up the other hillside, throwing large rocks and grabbing traction, going up a rock slide, then sat behind a large tree and was observing the brothers. After about 15 minutes, it got up and ran over the ridge, looked back and screamed, then continued to run. On to the next one. An eight-year-old boy was at camp for the first time at Camp Fairfield near Ligonier in Westmoreland County. Now the camp is called Antichan Village. Being intimidated by the wilderness at night, he would empty his bladder rather than make the 80-yard trip from the cabin to the outhouse. One rainy night, he got up from his bunk to sneak to the bush, but was stopped by the sound of footsteps coming around the cabin. Thinking that it was a counselor, he hurried back to his bunk. Lying in his bunk and feigning sleep, he saw a huge figure walk up to the doorway and peer into the room. The cabin was only 12 feet long, and there were no screens or doors. What he saw was a hulking figure, over 8 to 9 feet tall and covered with three to four inch long, wet, matted, dark brown hair. It had a cone-shaped head, and its shoulder muscles went directly from its head and down to its shoulders. The face looked like that of a gorilla. He had the distinct impression that it was a male and had no breast. The arms hung down by its side, and it had a pot belly. The hands were human-looking, and it had five fingers. The eyes glowed reddish to yellowish, the witnesses felt no threat from the creature, and it appeared calm and curious as it looked at him. On to the next one. A 16-year-old girl was riding her bike to explore a new camping area near the Tohichkan Valley campgrounds near Point Pleasant in Buck County. She felt as if she were being watched as she rode along. She got off her bike to investigate the new bathhouse, but the door was closed. She turned around to go back 
and saw what she described as the most but ugly creature that she had ever seen. It was standing on the other side of the split rail fence only eight feet away. Both of its hands were on the top rail of the fence and was shifting its weight from side to side. The face was clearly visible in the sunlight, but the body was lost in the shadow of the trees. It had a wild-eyed look on its face and appeared restless. The girl decided to get back onto her bike and ride back to her family. The Bigfoot was five foot five inches tall and monkeyish looking, but not human. She never told anyone. It had a rough, hairless face and looked like an ape. The skin was very light brown. The eyes were large, but in proportion to the head. She believed it to be a young male. On to the next one. A 15-year-old was with friends, skinny dipping in the local community swimming pool in Monview Park in Greensboro, which they used to sneak into at night. When he saw headlights coming and fearing that it was the caretaker who normally chased them out, the witness sounded the alarm and headed out through the hole in the fence that they had come in. It was around 9.30 p.m. and the witness ran into the woods that ran along the Monongalea River. As he was running ahead of the others and looking over his shoulders to see if his friends were following, he ran into something. As he fell backward, he looked up to see what appeared to be a man-like creature staring back at him. The creature was man-like in form and around eight feet tall. It was covered in long hair and had an unforgettable smell. The witness got to his feet and turned and ran in the direction where, running into the woods, he screamed at the top of his lungs, don't go that way, there was something back there, and I ran into it. The friends insisted that he had run into a tree, but he did not have all the marks that an impact with the tree would make. They lingered close to the pool until the caretaker went, and then all went home. On to the next one. On Route 45 in Center County in Pennsylvania, a teenage girl was in her house watching a Bigfoot that was watching her for more than two minutes. On to the next one. Near Footdale in Fayette County in Pennsylvania, a pair of parents and the three children were driving home from church when they all saw a reddish-brown Bigfoot on the side of the road that was walking in a slumped manner. On to the next one. I have lived in Adams County, Pennsylvania all of my life. On Thursday night, I would go out with my mother to play bingo at the Greenmont Fire Hall on Route 15, south of Gettysburg. I was about 13 years old. There were other kids there and we would play hide-and-go-seek and do all the fun stuff kids did back then. Playing bingo wasn't one of them. The fire hall held shooting matches and constructed a large target box behind the fire hall. I hid behind this target box during a hide-and-go-seek game. I remember that it was dark, perhaps 10 p.m., and the area was dimly lit by the outside light of the fire hall. I was backing around the corner of the target box and backed into a big animal. I turned to see what it was and saw this human-like figure, a little over five feet tall, not really heavy, covered with hair, not like a bear, but long like hair on the hooves of Clydesdale horses. I remember the odor as being a musk scent, like of sweat or of a deer-like musk, very strong. I took off running as fast as I could to tell the others, they or nobody else believed me, and when we went back to see if anything was really there, we found nothing. I often thought of that event, but convinced myself that a Sasquatch would not be found in a populated area such as this. Maybe I'm wrong. There was nothing around the target box when I got there because I ran around the thing seeing where I could hide. Whatever it was came almost like a ghost and left the same way. It was between 10 and 10.30 p.m. It was dimly lit and warm. Marsh Creek lies to the north about a quarter of a mile or less. The fire hall was in an open area, 
backed to the weft with heavy theater wood. On to the next one. A 15-year-old boy was playing ball with about 10 friends in a field by the creek on Barber Street in Bradford in McKean County in Pennsylvania. They played until dark and then darted off for home in different directions. Only the boy and a friend were left and they started home. The boy stopped because his shoe was untied and leaned down to tie it up. He started to get up for their trip home and when they looked behind them, they saw a very tall figure standing about 20 yards from them. The boy said, what is that? To his friend, at the time, it started running towards them. They ran as fast as they could to get out of there and it stopped chasing them. The boy and his friend got to the boy's house and told his father. They took some flashlights back out to the area but found nothing. The creature had originally come up from a creek and was upright and bipedal. It had extremely long arms and very long stride as it ran towards them. Incidentally, there have been several disappearances of children in this area. On to the next one. At Edinburgh Lake in Erie County in Pennsylvania, 18 miles from Presque Isle Park, two hunters saw a six-foot-tall hairy humanoid. Both witnesses fired at it, but it did not hit it. There were also UFOs in the area at the same time. It was on a peninsula jutting into a swampy area at the north end of the lake. On to the next one. My name is Aaron, and you better believe me when I say I'm the last person who would have ever believed in something like Bigfoot. For me to admit that it wasn't just folklore, I'd have to have one standing within a few feet of me. And that's pretty much what happened. I was born and raised in a northern suburb of Chicago known as Glenview. The street I lived on was one of those safe and pleasant streets where all of the houses were made of brick and looked nearly identical. Honestly, even aside from my denial of the existence of cryptids, the area was the last place I would have expected to see one. I'm pretty sure it was the year 2000, and I remember I was on summer break at the time. Normally, I spent my summer days playing baseball, but it was an off day, and I had my cousin Ross over to hang out. At the time that this happened, I was 14 and he was 15. Not even a mile away from my house was this small river that was really more like a stream. I don't know why we found it so entertaining, but Ross and I loved to bring a container of night crawlers and a couple of fishing poles over to the river to catch and release tiny panfish. When I think back on it, thank God we never ate any of those fish. The area had a lot of garbage everywhere, and who knows where the water truly came from. Also, near this somewhat filthy river was a trailer park. The fence of this trailer park ran alongside the park of the river, and it had seemed there was always commotion on the other side. It was dusk when this happened, because I remember that we were starting to lose light. On the section of the fence that was about a hundred feet away from us, there were like three or four younger boys that were laughing and hollering and flapping against the wooden fence. It just sounded like they were roughhousing, not an uncommon occurrence in the area. Per usual, Ross and I just ignored it and continued with fishing and shooting the breeze more than likely talking about girls. Even though we didn't live too far away from one another, we went to different public high schools that were bitter rivals in all sports. We seemed to get a lot of enjoyment from arguing about which of our schools had the hottest girls. No question, it was mine. We had started cleaning up and were getting ready to walk back home when we saw one of the trailer park kids' head pop up over the fence. The fence was much taller than most people, so the kid had to have gotten a boost from one of his pals. After looking directly at us, the younger boy continued to survey the area. They were far enough away where neither of us could really comprehend what they were saying, but it was apparent 
that he was looking for something particular. I assumed that maybe they had lost a dog or a cat or something like that and were trying to see if it had somehow managed to get onto the other side of the fence. It wasn't long after that we watched them throw some stuff over the fence. Whatever it was, it looked like food scraps of some kind. Again, we ignored it and continued with packing up our stuff. As we had turned and began heading toward the path that led home, the kid who was peering out over the fence started clapping his hands and whistling. Startled by the obnoxious noise, I glanced over my shoulder and saw what I at first thought was an enormous dog. I thought it was a dog because it was extremely hairy and was on all fours. It had its face near the ground and it was munching on whatever edibles the kid had tossed onto the ground. In amazement, Ross and I observed as one kid after another rose on the other side of the fence to get a look at the thing. Most of their reactions made it apparent that this wasn't the first time they had seen the large creature. It was more like they had gotten used to feeding it. I've always wondered what it was to them. Did they think it was a Sasquatch, or did they think it was some regular kind of ape that had someone busted out of captivity and was hiding out near the river? Either way, I don't think we observed the scene for more than 10 seconds before we bolted out of there like a couple of scared cats. I remember the laugh of the amused children fainting as we sprinted along the circular walkway toward home. I distinctly remember the smell of pepperoni pizza baking in the oven as we rushed through the door. We told my family all about what we had just seen, but of course, they found it incredibly hard to believe. Why would they? Ross and I were having an extremely difficult time with that ourselves. We discussed whether we should call the police to tell them about the whole thing so that they could go check out the scene, but my mom warned us that they would likely perceive it as a prank call and visit us instead. She was probably right, and that would be a hassle that we had no interest in dealing with. I want to say it was over a year before I gained the courage to go back to the area. Roth never joined me. It was so surreal being back at that location, and I remember questioning whether it even happened. Well, let me tell you, it did. These creatures are among us. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!